Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Scribble Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 15 of Project Alexandria, the look at the history of spaceflight using real solar system. We're starting the year at Cape Kennedy, Florida on January 22nd, 1968. A Saturn 1B is launching for Apollo 5, a lunar module test. There's no command module, so the flight is not manned. We're still getting things tested and worked out in preparation for the manned Apollo missions and moon landing next year. Speaking of moon landing, do you remember the Surveyor program? I showed the launch of Surveyor 1 in 1966, and for the last two years, there have been six other Surveyor flights. Finishing off with Surveyor 7 that landed on the moon just 12 days before this Apollo launch. Surveyor 1 was the initial engineering test flight to demonstrate the spacecraft's capability to perform mid-course and terminal maneuvers into soft land on the moon. There was a TV camera to record the landing site. Surveyor 2 was going to do the same thing in a new location, but only two of the three Vernier engines fired, so the craft ended up tumbling its entire trip to the moon and eventually crashed into the surface. Surveyor 3 tried it again, and this time with a new scooper to dig up and analyze some of the lunar surface. The craft bounced off the surface twice before landing for good because the reflective surface confused the landing radar for a bit. The engines didn't shut off when they were supposed to, but it did land properly eventually and sent back the first data about the surface soil. Its camera will later be returned by the Apollo 12 crew and placed in the Smithsonian Museum. Surveyor 4 was going great until it was time to land and then just blipped out and crashed, most likely after exploding on its way down. Surveyor 5 landed near the Apollo 11 site, mapping out the area to make sure we had good maps before sending Apollo 11. We've just jettisoned the three Ullage rockets on the upper stage after dropping the lower one. In a moment, we'll get rid of the fairing, which technically should be a nose cone, but there is no good KSP nose cone that has the right shape, so I used a fairing instead. So I'll just fade it from fairing to open payload. To finish off with the surveyor information now, Surveyor 6 touched down where the failed Surveyor 4 was supposed to go. After landing, the engines were restarted for a couple seconds for the first ever lunar liftoff and re-landing. It went four meters into the air and came back down about three meters further away. And finally, Surveyor 7 headed to a location that was as geographically different from all the other sites as they could possibly make it. So with this final mission completed, there's nothing left to do now but actually fly men to the moon. To do that, we need a functional lunar module, and that's where this flight comes in. The sole purpose of this flight is to test the lunar module capabilities, including engine starts and restarts in space. Lunar module development had fallen way, way behind schedule. There were no books or wiki pages to check for information about fabricating a lunar lander. There were no space industry veterans and craftsmen to consult. No one had ever done anything like this before, so they were making it up as they went along. Once in orbit, the descent engine on the lunar module was tested, but a leak earlier had caused the engine to shut down early. They tested the ascent engine a couple times, and then fired the descent engine manually a couple more times. Now in my case, I want to test my KSP model as well, so I'm activating the antenna on top and decoupling it and making sure that everything works as planned. In real life, the lunar module was dragged down, re-entered, and burned up over the Pacific two days after the launch. Now, if you remember last episode, I described the mission types A through J for Apollo. Well, this was a mission type B1, and NASA thought it was successful enough that B2 was canceled and no other B missions were flown. Apollo 4 had been mission A1, and in April, mission A2 will be flown as Apollo 6. It was supposed to be a repeat of the Apollo 4 mission plan, but this time, instead of just going out a short distance and faking return speeds with an additional engine burn, they were going to actually fly high enough to touch the orbit altitude of the moon and perform a realistic moon re-entry. They won't actually be going to the moon, they'll just be going up high enough that if the moon had been there, it would be high enough to have reached the moon. However, a problem with the second stage engines caused a ruptured fuel line or a few fuel lines and two of the engines shut down. It's called pogo oscillation. 
To put simply, it's when a pressure change in the fuel flow causes the engine thrust to reduce while at the same time making it easier for fuel to flow in. So that increase will cause the engine pressure to surge, which causes more back pressure in the engine thrust to go back down while more fuel flows in easily and the cycle repeats you end up getting a bouncing effect that can rupture fuel lines and blow up engines and even whole rockets. The third stage engine of Apollo 6 failed to restart later due to the pogo damage from stage 2 and so they ended up completely repeating the Apollo 4 flight plan using the command service module. But the mission was successful enough to give NASA confidence in the command module's ability to safely return men and so no other A-type missions were flown. Our next stop in history will be July 25th, 1968 in French Guiana. I am probably not going to launch from here again for quite a while, but this is a major launch site even today. It's where the Ariane 5 launches from, as well as many modern Soyuz and Vega launches. So it's worth a mention. I added some buildings to my RSS install to simulate a little bit of a launch complex, and from here I will fire up the Veronique AGI the first sounding rocket that crossed the Kármán line from this site. The rocket is powered by a 40 kilonewton LRBA engine on a single stage. It goes up, it sciences the, sh the space, it goes down. Pretty simple. Initial guidance was from ground wires that ran up to the little winglets at the bottom and once it got a little higher, those would decouple and drop off. It just flew on its own from there. It's filled with turpentine and nitric acid that fires for only about 42 seconds. Yep, turpentine, the stuff I used as a kid to strip paint and varnish off of things. There were a few variations of the Veronique sounding rocket used between 1950 and 1975. The last 11 were all launched from here at Kourou, which is also a great site for geosynchronous satellite launches because it's near the equator, so less inclination change is needed for the transfer orbit after launching.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you on this 15th day of September 1968, from the launch complex in Baikonur, flying for the Soviet Union, my first launch of a Proton Heavy Lifter. You've just seen the second stage engines ignite a little early to make sure they're running before decoupling the first stage. The cage separates in the middle and drops away the central tank that used to be filled with oxidizer as well as six radial strap-on fuel tanks and the engines that sat under them. Our payload is Zond 5, a modified Soyuz capsule designed to pass by the moon and then return home again, proving out the technology for a manned flight to and from the moon. This is a Proton K variety, part of the Proton family designed originally for long-range heavy nuclear warhead delivery. That's why it's fueled with UDMH and NTO, because those are storable hypergolic fuels that allowed the Proton to sit around as long as needed without needing to refrigerate the propellants while waiting for someone to give the order to press the big red button that destroys the world. Only the uppermost stage is kerosene and liquid oxygen because that stage was not designed as part of the original nuclear missile. It was added for delivery of payloads, such as what we're doing now. Four Vernier engines have just fired up in preparation for the second stage to run out of fuel. These Verniers will act as ullage while retros on the second stage pull the lower stack off. Then, once clear, the third stage engine will ignite and we can ditch our escape tower and fairing. We have the escape tower on as a test. This, of course, is not a manned flight to the moon. I have my engines set on all stages to simulate spinning up to full power. So that's why you see a bit of a sputter followed by a quick increase in the flames. And most throttles are locked just like on real engines. So this rocket may have come out of warfare technology, but today it's one of the world's most useful rockets. Having launched over 400 times, the Proton today can lift over 20 tons to orbit. Launching this Proton is a first for me, but for the Soviet Union, this is the 12th flight. Design for the vehicle started in 1961, and the first launch was back in 1965. It was called a UR-500 at the time. Testing was just getting started, and the first four launches went somewhat okay. One failed to get to orbit, but the others gave back some good data that allowed in iteration and improvements. In 1967, the new variations started being known as the Proton K, which is what I'm launching. The next flights did not go so well, at least one of them looked something like this. Because of the four, one had a first stage engine failure, one had a second stage engine failure, and one had a bad separation of its fourth stage. Then earlier this year, Zond 4 was launched toward the moon, but the guidance system failed and it was auto-destructed as it re-entered near Africa. Also, I have now mentioned Zond 4, and you know this is Zond 5, so what happened to 1 through 3? Well, the Zond program was a series of interplanetary satellites, so Zond 1 was sent to Venus. Although it failed somewhere along the way, Zond 2 went to Mars. And Zond 3 was supposed to go to Mars, but ended up actually just doing a flyby of the moon. But all three of those missions were just refinements of things that have already been done in space history and things that I have already shown. The third stage is just about drained. I have an action group set up to disable all the engines just in case to make sure the orbit doesn't get too high before we leave for the moon. The actual path we're taking is once again an over-the-planet lob that will try to hit the moon orbit as the moon is passing by because we are not even close to the same inclination as the moon right now. So little motors on the block D stage we're using right now will act as RCS and allow us to maneuver into position. They can also be used for ullage to light the block D engines. While we wait for the journey, let's take a look both forward and backward in this year and see some things that we won't be covering much otherwise. In 1964, a group of 10 European nations got together and founded the European Space Research Organization, also known as the ESRO, to carry out joint space science missions. The organization will last for 11 years before being folded into another new organization named the ESA for European Space Agency, which is still active today. In March of 1968, the ESRO launched their first satellite in coordination with the United States. 
It was called IRIS for International Radiation Investigation Satellite, also known as ESRO-2B. It was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base on a Scout B rocket into a polar orbit. Because of the polar orbit, one of the listening posts for the satellite was near a Russian mining town. And so as you might imagine, there were frequent and vigorous inspections of that listening post. The satellite lasted for three years before its orbit decayed. A month after IRIS, the first space telescope was launched by NASA on an Atlas SLV-3C Centaur D from Cape Kennedy Launch Complex 36B. It was a two-ton monster called Stargazer with amazing targeting accuracy, also known as Orbiting Astronomical Observatory 2. OYO-1 had failed in 1966 or else it would have been the first space telescope. OEO-2 survived four years and took hundreds of images, paving the way for future space telescopes. And therefore, the direct ancestor of all telescopes leading all the way up to and including the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I don't know if many of you noticed at the beginning of this launch, but I went from the wrong launch pad. At that time, I was still trying to work out my other launch pad and get it functional, and it wasn't working, so I launched my Proton from my Soyuz launch pad instead. Well, after I made this segment, I finally had the Proton pad working, so next time we can launch from here. I also set up another launch site, the Tanegashima launch pad. Japan had been experimenting with sounding rockets from this site, and in 1968, their first one crossed the Kármán line. Like Kuru earlier, this is still a major site even today. In 1969, the site will officially become part of the National Space Development Agency of Japan, which will in turn eventually become part of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, also known as JAXA, which still operates today. This sounding rocket is an LSC with two solid stages. Like the earlier test in Kuru, we go up, we science, we go down. Now getting back to the Zond 5, do you like turtles? I like turtles. The Soviets liked turtles. They sent two of them up on Zon 5 for a ride around the moon. They were safely returned, albeit with 10% less mass than when they left. Also returned were some flies, mealworms, plants, seeds, and bacteria. But about that return, Zond 5's star tracker failed once in space, so Soviet engineers were forced to devise a plan to use the Earth tracker instead. But that meant less accuracy and no lifting re-entry. Instead, it came back on a screaming ballistic trajectory that would have subjected a human occupant to some less than pleasant g-forces. I have detached a latching mechanism between the service module and the capsule so I can re-enter. The top science package was released and then the service module. I should have decoupled a little sooner, but I was caught off guard by how fast we'd get re-entry effects at this angle. I also didn't remove the thermal cover in time to simulate it getting burned off during re-entry. Ultimately, the capsule made it back okay, though because of the inaccuracy, it was forced to land in the Indian Ocean instead of in the Soviet Union. A U.S. Navy ship was dogging the Soviet ships through international waters trying to get a look at what came back. For a while, the U.S. thought it might be a man because the Soviets had rigged the capsule to transmit human speech back as a test. And the United States was able to pick that up. Plus, the capsule, when the U.S. ship got a look at it, looked like something a man might come back in. Manned NASA flights were suspended for 21 months after the Apollo 1 incident. They're ready to get men back into an Apollo test though, and so this command module is loaded with astronauts. Walter Schirra, Don Isley, and R. Walter Cunningham. It's October 11th, 1968, launching from Cape Kennedy, complex number 34, and they're lifting off on top of a Saturn 1B. This is the first Apollo Saturn launch to carry crew. It's essentially carrying out the tasks that would have been assigned to Apollo 1 if they had flown almost two years ago. I've reused my Saturn 1 launcher, but I've needed to make some modifications to the engines, fuel loads, and of course the payload. The engines are more powerful and more efficient now. The lower stage holds more propellant. 
and the command service module and command module are on top. The cargo bay that would hold a lunar module is empty. The lunar module is way, way behind schedule. Instead, we have a docking target that we can use once in orbit. Wally Shara had been keeping a very close eye on production and safety issues since the Apollo 1 incident. He had already declared his intention to retire from the program after this flight. He's already gone up twice, once for Mercury Atlas 8 and once for Gemini 6A. He didn't want to risk mistakes on his last flight and the first flight since Apollo 1, where all eyes across the world would be on this mission and failure would probably have meant the end of the moon program. There was a lot of pressure on them to be successful. They almost scrubbed the flight due to medium winds. They were deemed within allowable tolerance, but Shira was not willing to take any risks. An aborted liftoff might blow the parachuting capsule back over land instead of coming down over the ocean. And if that happened, then they might have been seriously injured because the capsule was not built for that and not tested for that scenario. Even though the ground was urging him that he should fly, it was Shiraz's call as the commander. But ultimately, he decided to fly. Problems with the crew didn't stop there. This was the first relatively spacious capsule interior. I don't know how you call a large phone booth with three men in it spacious, but it was in comparison to Mercury and Gemini capsules. They had enough space to cause motion sickness, which was a new thing for NASA astronauts. They were also supposed to stay this way for 11 days, all cramped up in there to simulate the duration of a moon and back trip. Combine that with displeasure about the food choices they had provided, and then Shira got a head cold and passed it on to the other men so they were all sick, and on top of all of that, they needed to share a toilet in the openness of the cabin that took half an hour to use. So they were irritable, and they were talking back to the capsule communications officers. Shira, of course, was retiring, so he didn't really care what Capcom thought, but their near mutiny in space earned Isley and Cunningham seats on the sidelines for the remainder of the space program. So how about some more spaceflight firsts? This is, of course, the first three-person crew. It's also the first live TV broadcasts for America. We're also going to use the spent second stage for more maneuverability tests. You can see the jaws of the second stage there opening up to reveal the docking target. The crew maneuvered around the stage, moving closer and further and closer again, and experimented with simulating docking alignment maneuvers a few times. And then they also tested the main engine, the SPS, that would be needed for a moon flight. They fired it up eight different times, and every time it was a perfect success. The nice part about some of these early missions where I don't actually fly to the moon yet and do all that is I get to do the exact same testing in KSP that they were doing in real life, ensuring that when it comes time for my real mission that all of my craft will be ready as well. So I took this opportunity to fly around my spent second stage as well, aligned myself with the docking target, and then flew myself around in a circle and came back and aligned myself again each time testing my RCS system to make sure that I had all the maneuverability that I was going to want to have. I'm speeding up and slowing down the playback of the footage just to give you the idea of what it was like, but without spending the full real time that it took. This is the only time you're going to get to see those angry alligator jaws opened up and just sitting there like that. In a real launch, the cargo bay was supposed to open up a lot more than it did here. They didn't just open partially here, they were asymmetrical, opened and stuck at multiple angles. NASA will solve that for the Apollo 8 and other missions by jettisoning the panels. So now it is my time to return home. We will decouple the command module from the service module and head back down through the atmosphere. Later in the same month, the Soviet Union launched the unmanned Soyuz 2, and the next day after it, Soyuz 3 carrying one cosmonaut. If you remember Soyuz 1, it was manned, and the intent was for the second launch to carry three cosmonauts, and have two of them transfer over to Soyuz 1 on EVA. After things went horribly wrong with Soyuz 1, the second flight was scrubbed and the entire program was put on hold. So now that we're launching again, the first Soyuz carries no one at all. If anything goes wrong, no one will be put at risk. 
Once we know that everything is okay, the second mission will carry one cosmonaut just like was the original plan for Soyuz 1. On board are Georgi Beregovoy with Vladimir Shatolov being the backup and Boris Volyanov as the second backup. Remember that name because we're going to have quite the story of his next flight. For this mission, they will not be going on an EVA like was planned for the last time. There's no huge space flight first here, but since I only covered a failed Soyuz launch in the last episode, perhaps the first here is the successful launch and return of cosmonauts in a Soyuz. The Soviet Union published a picture of their Soyuz 3 on the launch pad, making that the first time the outsiders had legitimately seen any of their launch vehicles in that condition too. Another part of the old mission plan that is different is we are no longer going to transfer the crew from one to another. As I said, we're going to dock the two craft together instead. The docking node has no hatch and can't actually transfer a crew, but it can dock the two craft together to show that it's possible for this in the Soviet program. However, they never successfully docked and only practiced rendezvous a couple times. And as a result, the Soviet Union only reported publicly that the rendezvous had been carried out and that that was a, the success of the mission. They never mentioned their intent to dock. That was a fairly common thing for them at the time. They would only report after something was successful and not tell anyone what they were going to try ahead of time. For Soyuz 2, they didn't even mention that it was being launched until it was safely in the air along with Soyuz 3 on the way up. The real next spaceflight first should be the docking of two manned vehicles, since both docking and rendezvous have been previously covered. So I will get to that next time on Project Alexandria as we launch Soyuz 4 and Soyuz 5. So suffice it to say, from this point it's your standard decoupling and re-entry of a couple capsules. And rather than showing a couple of those, we're going to go on to the next segment. Last episode, I talked about issues like the Vietnam War protests and race riots, and those were only worse throughout the year we've been following for this episode. North Vietnam launched the Tet Offensive into South Vietnam and against the United States military personnel there. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. North Korea captured the USS Pueblo an American surveillance ship, and tortured its crew, which worsened Cold War tensions in that area. It was all around a pretty bad time, so here at the end of the year on December 21st, 1969, Apollo 8 is launching on a mission to orbit the moon. If they can pull this off, then at least we can end the year with something positive, all out of all the negative that's led up to this. Apollo 7 restored some confidence in the United States space program, but Apollo 8 is the first crewed Saturn V. It looks like we're just about to launch though, so let's check in with the countdown. 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit, we have, we have lift off. This is a huge milestone in a lot of ways. I'm not even sure I can count all the space flight firsts going on, so I'll just name a few major ones along the way. You of course remember that we have five F-1 engines producing almost 34,000 kilonewtons of thrust. And once we lose some fuel mass, we'll shut down the center engine and run with just four until we burn out. This takes about two and a half minutes. One minute for 40 seconds. All looks great. Mile and six tenths into the mission, and uh, Frank Borman has confirmed each event as it's been passed to him by Mike Collins at this point. The crew has been given a go for staging. We're burning out now, so it's time to stage. We decouple the huge Boeing first stage, ignite the Ullage solid motors to settle our upper stage propellants, 
then activate the 5J2 engines followed by dropping the interstage ring that the Ullage motors were on. We'll go like this until stage 2 has burned out, which takes about 6 minutes. Staging throws the astronauts forward in their seat harnesses and then slams them back into the seats as the engines kick in. It's not the most pleasant ride, but now it's much smoother. Nothing will be as rough as that was, not until re-entry, of course. The capsule shroud and escape tower have been jettisoned, so they can see out the window, too. Flight director Cliff Charlesworth gets an enthusiastic go from both trajectory and booster at 4 minutes 50 seconds into the flight. The North American aviation stage is drained, so now we decouple that Fire four retro motors and two Ullage motors to prep the McDonnell Douglas Corporation third stage. Right on top of that are IBM computers and the avionics ring controlling it all. Our single J2 motor starts up to power the third stage and then we jettison the two spent Ullage solid motors. Some videos online show a third stage separation with three motors. But those are for a Saturn 1B launch, even though sometimes that video gets included as a clip in Saturn 5 launch videos, this is a Saturn 5 and there are only two Ullage motors on this. We are in a stable orbit, floating along in microgravity to our translunar insertion node, at which point we will hear what is perhaps one of the most understated sentences in all of human history. It's a few simple words with no real perceivable emotion behind them, and yet they represent humankind's initiation of a journey that will lead to men orbiting another celestial body for the first time. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. I understand. We're go for TLI. The auxiliary propulsion system fired up to settle our propellants, and the J-2 started up again. We'll burn this about five minutes until our orbit goes way out to the moon, at which point the three astronauts on board, Commander Frank Borman, Command Module Pilot James Lovell, and Lunar Module Pilot William Anders will become the fastest humans who have ever lived up to this point. After the TLI, we can decouple the Command Service Module and use the RCS to move ahead of it, preventing collision with the third stage. Remember the last launch when I said the alligator jaws didn't open properly and NASA would solve that problem in the next and all future launches? Well, they did it by making the panels jettison. For some reason, when I tried to decouple mine, they didn't have an ejection force and so didn't float away properly, but I'll get that fixed for the next launch. The Apollo 8 crew spun their capsule around and looked back at the spent stage, taking some pictures of it. The lunar module is still not ready for launch, so that's why you can only see a lower half dummy mock-up to add some ballast. This flight was supposed to be a lunar module test, but when the LM was not ready, they had to think of what to do instead. This mission was not part of the original plan. They didn't want to repeat a previous test because NASA had decided that redoing successful tests was a waste of time. But someone said, hey, why don't we fly to and orbit the moon without a LEM? It would be a huge first and we'd still get some good test results out of the mission that way. NASA agreed and so here we are. We're doing a mid-course correction to bring ourselves within 116 kilometers of the surface. The spacecraft was also put into a roll to make sure that the sun baked all the outer surfaces and not just one spot all the time. This helped to mitigate that hot car in the sun effect that I talked about before. It's not cold in space, it's hot. Very, very hot, at least in the sun like they are. They took turns sleeping, so someone was always on the comms with Capcom in Houston back on Earth. The insertion burn was out of communications with NASA, so they didn't know it was successful until they had come out the other side, but they were safe, and along the way they'd taken the first Earthrise picture. While testing and practicing during some free time, Jim Lovell accidentally erased the computer's position information and had to manually realign the craft. Remember that fact for when we do the 1970 history episode. Frank Borman read from the Bible, which caused some controversy about religious diversity, and future NASA missions shied away from doing anything religious in space. Anyway, they took some video, pictures, sent audio back to Earth, wished everyone a Merry Christmas, orbited ten times, and then headed home. And that closes out 1968, so until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.
uh, we've got the below uh, eight now in, in Lunar Orbit. Uh, there's a cheer in this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. Uh, switching.